Matthew chapter 16, start with verse 5. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Bring your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, It's because we did not, we did not bring bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You fool, or you little baby, why are you talking amongst yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the five thousand and how many baskets fools you gathered? For seven loaves for the four thousand and how many baskets full, uh, uh, fools you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I'm not talking to you about bread? Be in your guard against the uh, yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not talking to them and uh, the guard against the yeast used in bread but against the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Let's go to God in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings that you have given us. God, we just pray that you just please bless this time that we have today, that we understand your word a little bit more clearly, that you would give me the words of wisdom to explain it accurately, and that you would just bless us in understanding and taking your word into our lives today. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Starting in today's lesson, we're going to take a few weeks to start to look at the religious teachers in the New Testament. Today we started talking about the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I want us to focus on the Pharisees. Now here's why. The scripture tells us there is nothing new under the sun. And I'm going to tell you that is true. When it comes to religion, when it comes to religious practices, there is nothing new under the sun. The problems we read about in the uh, Gospels and the Book of Acts with the religious teachers, such as the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, the Herodians, and even some we don't read about, the Essenes, these are all found in church history in some form or fashion. These are all found even within the church today. Now, the important thing to understand is we can't change history. I, I wish our society would learn it. You cannot change history. What can you do? You can learn from it. You can take what has happened in history. You can examine it honestly. You can take a look and allow history to be a mirror to your life and see what's going on in today's society and say, we don't want to repeat the same mistakes. When we are looking at the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, the Herodians, the ones we're going to look at over this next month, what we're going to do is say, what mistakes did people make with these groups? What was the actual problems and how do we avoid them? You see, during the ministry of Jesus Christ, the Pharisees were a major problem. This is why we're starting with them first. All of them actually were. But the Pharisees by far get the most attention in the Gospels. They rate the greatest interference. You want to know one of the saddest truths in religious history is? The number one enemy of religious reform is religious people. Specifically, religious leaders. When you go through history and you look at all the great reforms and reformations and restorations that have happened in Christianity, the number one people that opposed them were other religious people. Yes, the government does do it. Yes, the non-believing world does do it. But you'd be surprised at this. And the Pharisees did this. As Jesus was not only just bringing reform to Judaism to the forefront, not only was he trying to, to usher in the kingdom of God, he is having to take time to battle with these men. And as I said earlier, unfortunately, religious extremes have found a home in Christianity. So what was their problem? You see, in order to avoid these extremes, in order to avoid these problems, 
we need to learn what the problems are and see how to avoid it. So today we're going to take an in-depth look at the problems with the Pharisees and see how we keep Phariseeism out of the church. What did the Pharisees actually believe? When we turn into the scriptures, there are two major groups during the times of Jesus and the apostles. There were other religious groups, but there's two major camps. Okay? I want you to think about you know, how many different denominations and stuff we've got in Christianity. In some ways, you can almost divide them up into two or three groups. You really can. This is what we're talking about here. I want to tell you, first of all, and this may surprise some people, but not everything the Pharisees believed was false. Not everything the Pharisees believed in were false. In fact, if Phariseeism was alive today, if we were to go back, there was going to be places where we're going to find agreement. They would say something, and we would actually say we would agree with that. Now, but what were they? There are at least three areas of agreement with the Pharisees. Two of them can be seen very clearly in the passage we're going to read. Acts chapter 23, starting with verse 6. Luke, who is actually a Gentile, gives us a note that really not many of the other gospel writers give. See, as a, as a Gentile, as the only Gentile author in the entire New Testament, and by the way, he and Paul makes up over half of the New Testament. That's how much Luke actually wrote the two books. He's a good doctor, and he's, he's a little bit worthy. We're, we're grateful for him. He gives us a little bit of insight in Scripture that if we didn't have it, we'd have to actually go study and, and dig a little deeper. And he tells us a little bit about the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Acts chapter 2, or excuse me, Acts chapter 23, starting with verse 6. Then Paul, knowing that some of uh, were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out into the Sanhedrin. My brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees said that there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits. But the Pharisees acknowledged them also. Paul is being brought before trial. What you imagine, I was being brought before trial of Congress today, and I looked out in the Congress and said, well, how am I going to split this out? And I just said, you know, guys, I, I am here because I believe in lowering taxes. Well, that's going to divide the book by, right? They're going to start arguing about that. That's what Paul does here. He says, guys, hey, you know what? As he looks at the Pharisees and Sadducees and knows he can get them arguing with each other and quit arguing with him, he says, you know, the only reason I'm really here, I'm a Pharisee, you know. I believe in the resurrection, and I believe in the afterlife. Well, now they, they turn their attention from Paul. It's a very comical thing. The Pharisees, who have no agreement anywhere else with Paul, finally says, you know what, maybe he's right. And they, they argue so much with each other that they forget about Paul. Well, here's what we're seeing in this passage. First of all, let's understand that the Pharisees, this is not seen in the passage, but you've got to understand this in order to understand their belief system. They believe the entire Old Testament books. When you go back and look at the Old Testament books that we accept, all of them, the Pharisees accepted all of them, every last one of them. So we would find agreement in that. The, the, the Sadducees only believe the five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's it. So they could not agree on what's scripture. We would agree with the Pharisees on this. Number two, they believed in the resurrection. The Pharisees actually believe that when you die, that there is an afterlife. Now, understand that the afterlife is not really well defined in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament, so we might have some debate and disagreement there, but they believe that there was going to be a resurrection of the dead. Third, they believed in angels. Which is a very funny thing, because there are actually angels mentioned in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But let me tell you what, when you start denying the scriptures, toss reason out. 
It doesn't make sense at that point. So even though the Sadducees said they believed in the Old Testament books, they did not believe, or in the books of Moses, they did not believe in the angels that Moses wrote about. This is the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees actually had the capacity to believe Christ. This is what I mean about this. When Jesus starts talking about the afterlife, when Jesus starts talking about the resurrection of the dead, when the apostles start preaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Pharisees actually had the capacity to believe this. They believed the Old Testament prophets. They believed in Jeremiah, Isaiah, and the Old Testaments of old. They had the capacity to do it. They just chose not to. We'll talk about why they chose not to here in a minute. Guys, here's a point I want to make about this. Sometimes there are people out there that look like they may believe what we believe. But when you dig deeper, when you actually examine what they, they say, you find out that they don't. Be careful. The best false teaching has enough of the real in it to be trickery. Let me give you an example of what I mean today. If I were to pass around counterfeit money, so I went to my Monopoly board and pulled out my Monopoly money, am I going to be able to pass that off? No. But what if I get some paper that looks like a $100 bill paper, and I print it as close as I can to it, and I get it as close to the field as possible, I can pass that off. Even though it's still counterfeit, I can still pass it off. The best false teaching has just enough of an element of the truth in it to be deceptive. They may have had similar beliefs, but it doesn't mean that they had total agreement. So what was their problem? The arguments between Jesus and the Pharisees often revolved around what is called their tradition. Jesus calls it, he labels it, the traditions of men. Now this is found in Matthew 15, 1 through 9. By the way, I, I really want to highlight how Jesus says this. The traditions of men. Matthew chapter 5, 15, 1 through 9. I don't believe he uses this accidentally. I believe this is a really intentional saying he says here. We're going to see why in just a second. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't eat their hands before they eat. And Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever help he might otherwise have received from me is a gift devoted to God, he is not to honor his father with it. And thus you know about the word of God for the sake of your tradition. He had the faith. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. While there were some similar beliefs, their traditions totally destroyed any chance at unity in a common belief. So what are the traditions of the Pharisees? Now, in order, in order to understand this, because here's one of the things that really happens, which really drives me nuts. Okay, when we look at this, this terminology of traditions, sometimes we read this very, very wrong. There is something specific here that the Pharisees had that Jesus is attacking. Because some people will take a look at this and say, see, no churches should have any traditions. I want to tell you something. There is no such thing as a church without traditions. If the church says we have no tradition, you know what they are? They're in denial. I once went, when I used to do fill-in preaching, I used to go in and fill in in a church. I'm not going to tell you where um, for a variety of reasons. But this was the church's practice. They said, we don't want to get caught up in tradition. So each week, we just reversed the order of service. So when I got in there, I always had to get there early. Because I may be going on first in communion and then the singing. 
Or it may be next week, the singing, the preaching, the communion. The third week, it may be the communion, the preaching, the singing. Every week it was different. Saying, we don't want a tradition. You know what their tradition was? Confusion. <laughs> Every church has tradition. It's there. Well, there is something specific we want to look at here. Number one, the teachings were passed on by previous teachers. I'm going to use a couple words here because I, I tend to have that, that, that slur or that accent with me. I'm going to spell it out for you, okay? The, the, the Jewish Old Testament law was called the Torah. T-O-R-A-H. That's what they called it, the Torah. It was a written Torah. It was passed on. By the time the Pharisees came on, they believed in what they called the oral. O-R-A-L. Oral Torah. Which was the traditions passed on by previous rabbis and teachers, which were really not for sure its origins. These teachings is what the Pharisees are holding on to here. And they considered them to be religiously binding. Which is where this war between Jesus and the Pharisees come from. Jesus is holding to the Old Testament principles. The Torah, the written Torah, which the Pharisees are in agreement with. But the Pharisees come in here with a whole other law. Legitimately a whole other law. And says, well you're holding to the written word, what about the oral word? And this is where they keep budding heads. They believed that following these teachings, they would obey the law. I want you to imagine here. I brought the baby in and I had the plate pin here, right? I put the baby in the plate pin. The purpose of putting the baby in the plate pin is to keep the baby safe, right? Safe from her injuring herself or for something or someone else injuring her, right? So we got the plate pin here. <coughs> The idea of the oral Torah was putting the written Torah in a playpen. Protection. If you obey the, the oral Torah, you'd obey the written one. The passage I chose here is a very interesting one. Because Jesus directly attacks it. So this is how they played their little religious games. The Bible tells them to honor their father and mother. They're in agreement with it. It's written in the Torah. Okay? So, let's imagine it's modern day. My mom and dad says, our vehicles are all done. You have an extra vehicle. We need a vehicle to run to the stores and all this to take care of ourselves. I said, mom and dad, I really can't help you. You know, Mariah's got a car. I've got a car. Now, that third car there, that's dedicated to God. I can't let you have it. What do you mean it's dedicated to God? Well, according to the law of Corbin, which is what they're calling here, I can dedicate that car to God, and as long as I'm alive, I get to keep it. And then when I die, it gets used for God. So now my parents can't have my vehicle. Their oral Torah just shredded the written one, which is what Jesus has this problem with. Anytime we elevate tradition, for traditional teachings, we will always diminish Scripture. The Reformation movement with Martin Luther and the Restoration movement with the Campbells both had a similar idea, Scripture only. We're going to take away the traditional teachings of religious people, we're going to take away the traditions that people have hold on to, and we're going to go in our only act of, of faith and everything else is going to come strictly from teaching of the scriptures. That's the goal. Because the second you elevate traditional teachings, traditional practices with the scripture, you will always break the scripture. Always. It's not even close. They have been told that the problem we have is we do things Traditionally, our ritual, and we forget to examine, does that really come from the scripture doing it that way? Or does it come from the tradition of man? 
traditionally, the American church, we meet for morning worship on Sunday. New Testament tells us to meet on the first day of the week. Which means, of those 24 hours, we could meet in any of those and still be biblical. But you go to say, you know what, we're no longer going to meet at 10.30 in the morning. We're going to meet at 8 o'clock at night. You watch how many people say, you just read the Bible. It's perfectly legit. In fact, the majority of the church around the world has to do that. Because they don't get off on Sundays. They have to either meet early in the morning or late at night and hope that the government doesn't find them. Now, their man-made traditions or teaching was only part of the problem. It was their hypocrisy. You see, in the Bible, a hypocrite is a person who is an actor wearing a mask. You guys remember those old Greek plays where they would hold up the mask and, you know, and cover their face and pretend to be somebody else? In the Bible, the word hypocrite is that actor. Someone who wears a mask, pretends to be someone or something else. This is the problem of the, of the Pharisees. When Jesus calls them a hypocrite, he said, you are pretending to be something you're not. You're playing a role. The Pharisees were hypocrites with their religious games. Sometimes they were with what they called the scribes and the lawyers. Now, we understand what a lawyer is in court of law. They're talking about a religious lawyer, and there's actually, believe it or not, depending on your faith tradition and your religion, there are still such things today as lawyers in the religious realm. And what these guys did is the same thing lawyers do today. They try to find the loopholes and walls. Look at such an example. Matthew 23. Matthew 23 is a passage, if you really want to understand what the problem with the Pharisees are, read this whole chapter. And then reread it, and reread it a third time, because it takes you more than once to get everything here. But in Matthew 23, starting with verse 16, we see part of the problem. Woe to you blind gods! You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift on the altar that makes the gold, uh, gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and the one who dwells on it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. So this is what they did. In the Bible, it tells us to be honest, right? Don't say anything false about your neighbor, but when you go on and you look at when God talks about making an oath, if you make a swear, you make an oath to God, you are expected to keep it no matter what. Well, who likes that? So the Pharisees decided to come up with a game. You swear by the temple, you can break that up. Nowhere in Scripture is that found. Anywhere. Ever. In fact, Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil. But then they showed what was really important because the temple was the most sacred building in all of Israel. Say, so if you swear by that temple, you can break your oath, but if you swear by the gold, well, of the temple, you got to keep it. They showed what was in their hearts, that the gold mattered more than the temple. The gold mattered more than the temple. But see, here's, here's a religious game. You say you believe a law, you say you believe a commandment, but you really don't want to keep it, so you look for ways to get around it. Whenever I dealt with, with teenagers and, and kids and youth group, I always had a rule. It's a rule I hold to. I, I'd rather you break the rule than to see how close to the edge you can get without breaking it. You want to know why? 
is at least when you're breaking the rule, you're showing me who you are. When you're trying to get as close to the rule as possible and still keep it, what you're telling me is, I really want to be bad, but I don't want to deal with the punishment. When we do that with God, what we're telling God is, yeah, I really don't want to obey you. So how much like the world can I be and still be in good shape with you? What you're really telling God is, I really don't love you enough to want to obey your command. If I want to play a religious game where I feel good about myself. That's what the Pharisees were doing. How close can I get to a sin without sinning? Why don't we ask, how close can I get to righteousness to stay away from sin? Religious teachers must, and I want to highlight that word too, if you're, if you're writing in your outline, circle that word, must be held to a high standard and not be people who play religious games. James chapter 3, verse 1. Here, notice this. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged much stricter. The strongest condemnation that Jesus gave of anybody in the Gospels, the Pharisees and Sadducees, in the New Testament, the single strongest condemning was done of false teachers. In the Old Testament, <coughs> the biggest condemnations was given against false prophets. God holds people who claim to be teachers to a very high standard. If you're going to go around and play religious games, don't be a teacher, don't be a leader. Because that's dangerous. And when the church starts to accept that from its teachers and its leaders, the church will be corrupted. But this is not the only problem. They're, they had an ultimate weakness. Who did they serve? Jesus told us very plainly, we cannot serve two masters. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve both God and money. Big old Crooch Boys fan. Growing up, they used to have that song, Trying to Love Two Women. You guys remember that? Talk about how it was a ball of shame, about how miserable it was making their lives. Same thing happens in the religious world. God describes our relationship with Jesus Christ as the bride and the groom. So gentlemen, since, since Jesus here is the groom, the church is the bride, let me ask the gentleman, how many boyfriends or husbands are you going to allow your wife to have? Would it make a difference to you? You can't serve two masters. You have to make a choice. And the problem was the Pharisees loved money, power, and the recognition of people more than God. They claimed to love God. They said they loved God. But Jesus, you can see right through her heart, told them what their problem was. Matthew chapter 23, start with verse 5. Matthew chapter 23, start with verse 5. Everything they do, if everything they do is done from in the sea. They make their parklets wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the places of honor of banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplace and to have men call them rabbi. They wore the clothes, they took the names because they loved the position and the power it gave them. They loved people more than God. When we want the attention of man, we've already received our reward. Except my words, it's Jesus Christ's words in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Talking about worship in the Sermon on the Mount, he says this. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. If you want to please 
men. And that's what God's going to give you as your reward. That means you lose out on heaven. That's the seriousness of it. And trust me, plenty of people in the religious world, they love men much more than they love God. So what does this cost them? Their fault. Their traditions of men caused them to doubt Christ. They didn't understand the difference between the Word of God, which is what Jesus was following, and the traditions or teachings of man. So as a result, you have to choose. Guys, theology matters. Doctrine matters. Bad theology blinds. Since they chose the traditions of men, they were blinded to the truth of Jesus Christ. Their pride calls them to ignore the miracles. Whenever they saw a miracle of Jesus, they tried to dismiss it. Matthew chapter 12, starting with verse 22. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind of you, and Jesus healed him so that he could talk, both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? When the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, this fellow drives out demons. He could raise the dead, which he did. He could heal the sick, which he did. He could drive out demons, which he did. And none of it was good enough because their bad theology, their arrogance, and their willful disobedience, their heart and heart all caused them to say, what I'm seeing is not what I see. What I'm hearing is not what I hear. Guys, when we talk about Scripture, people say, well, if God just... Just announced his voice from the heavens, people would believe. When he did that in the gospel, some people said it was thunder. I've never heard thunder talk, have you? You can dismiss anything that you want to with that hardened heart. Their hardened heart blinded them and caused them their salvation. Their hardened heart blinded them. Cost them their salvation. How did that happen? We're going to go back and look. They had the capacity to believe because they, they had the right beginning. They just didn't continue it on. Why? Because the traditions of men were so binding to them, they ignored the scriptures. And when it came down to it, they had these religious games. Whenever you play religious games with God, you're always going to end up denying Him. And then, not only did they have religious games, not only were they, they have another teaching, but they wanted that praise of men so bad. They just ignored God. They lost their salvation based on these things. <coughs> In the religious world today, there are still Pharisees out there. <coughs> Which means this, we must be careful who we follow. 1 John gives us a similar warning that we can go back into the Old Testament and find. A similar warning we can find in Jesus' very teachings. Similar warning that's even placed in the book of Revelation. But we're just going to say this. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. In other words, here's the point we're trying to make. When you're listening to the religious world out here, be careful about a superficial hearing. Superficial hearing means that you're really not thinking about it. You're really not examining it. You're really not testing it. And therefore, you just observe, absorb everything, and sometimes you'll follow Pharisee without knowing it. 
I tell you guys, I like history. And here, you want to know the things about learning about history? If you really want to learn history, it's not about reading a history book. You want to know why? Because even the best history books have a bias in it. You realize that? It's there. They have a bias in it. They can try to remove it, but it's still there. If you really want to learn history, you know what you really need to do? The one thing we don't do anymore. Go back to the original source. As much as possible, read the original source. Read the original eyewitnesses. Read the original people's writings. You wonder why? You'll see stuff that sometimes doesn't make the history books. You'll see things that sometimes even contradict some history teachers. You go back to the original source. In religion, this is the original source. Right here. So whenever you're listening to a religious teacher, you go back and you examine the original source. You, really, you examine the scriptures. I don't give you guys outlines because I'm bored during the week. I give them to you so you have the scriptures I am talking about here. And you can go back and reread them and say, did Jason put them in the right context? Did he quote it accurately? Or did he twist it to make him say something he wanted to say? Because even the best of preachers will do that unintentionally. Go back to the original source. Or else you may be following somebody who is teaching the traditions of men and want the praise of men more than God, and you'll be caught up in Phariseeism before you even know it. Because it's alive and well today. You have the ability and the capacity to follow the true gospel. So that's your question this week. Are you following the true gospel? I am to the point in my life with my research of anything that I am doing anywhere where I say I question sources. Because I want to know that I'm following the truth, the falsehood, a bias, or a tradition. And when it comes down to the gospel, you don't just take somebody's word for it. You research the gospel yourself. And you examine it. And you say, am I following the truth? Or am I following the dangerous path of Phariseeism alive and well in this world today? Because your faith is your responsibility. I want to say that again. Your faith is your responsibility. It's not somebody else's. It's not your husband's or wife's. It's not your father or your mother's. It's not your grandparents. It's not your children's. It's not your neighbor's. It's not even your preacher. Sorry. Your faith is your responsibility. What are you following? <coughs> Do you know it to be true? More importantly, is it what you really believe? We're here in search of one thing, one thing only, the gospel. Because it is the only thing that's going to save your soul. So where are you at today? Have you followed the true gospel? Are you following it in your life? Or are you just hoping that you are? You can make sure and make sure that that is real by believing that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, confessing Him as your Lord and Savior, repenting of your sins, being baptized with the forgiveness of your sins, and giving the Holy Spirit, rededicating your life if you need to. Whatever choice you need to make today, we encourage you to do it as we stand and sing your invitational song.